uh, our next session. Uh, and really, uh, normally we would kind of bring international keynote speakers into QUT to talk about the topics when we hold a big conference. Because of all the COVID uh, travel restrictions this time around, we've tried to um, bring in some international perspectives um, through uh, some recorded um, videos. Um, we have three talks on international makerspaces. Uh, Dr. Chris Armstrong um, from uh, Wits University in Joburg and the University of Oswa is talking about institutionalization and informal innovation in South African maker communities. Hello, greetings everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Chris Armstrong. I, uh, I do research or I, I research for the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg and also for the University of Ottawa in Canada. And I am part of the Open African Innovation Research Network, which in fact has a presence both in South Africa and Canada. And I'll tell you more about open air, as we call it, um, after I say my hello. So first of all, uh, many thanks to Professor Rimmer for uh, contacting me and inviting me to be part of this. And uh, obviously it's too bad not to be able to interact with uh, those of you in Brisbane, but greetings to you all. Um, and uh, I will now try and uh, tell you a little bit about the research that I've been involved in in South Africa, uh, looking at maker communities, um, and then have a, a question and answer with Professor Rimmer after that. So to just tell you a little bit more about the uh, Open African Innovation Research Network that I'm part of, uh, if you want to find out more about it and, and read about some of the research the network has done, you can go to the URL, which is provided there in the slide. We have researchers in 20 African countries, and we also have uh, researchers in Canada and Europe. And we have institutional hubs for the open air network at the University of Cape Town, University of Johannesburg, Strathmore University in Nairobi, Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, the American University of Cairo, and the University of Ottawa. And you can see there on the screen who, who our funding uh, comes from. So uh, to give you an example of the reach of the network, I, I work for University of Ottawa, but I also work for Wits University, um, which I mentioned at the, at the top of this presentation, which is also in Johannesburg. So, Though Vince University isn't one of the institutional hubs, it's one of the many institutions on the continent that is part of the network. So Open Air actually has five thematic research clusters, um, which you can see there in the, in the slide. Technology hubs, informal innovation, indigenous entrepreneurs, and then cross-cutting themes, innovation metrics, and laws and policies. Now, the key to understanding the work of open air is actually in the name, Open African Innovation Research. So we're interested in African innovation, but we're particularly interested in the open elements of it or, or types of innovation, which seem to be driven by openness. And that then the minute you start to focus on openness, then uh, obviously you start to talk, one of the things you talk about is openness in approaches to the outcomes of innovation, i.e. approaches to knowledge and intellectual property. So that is one of the, you know, that is one of the cross-cutting strains uh, in the research is, is looking at when people innovate in African settings, how do they govern their knowledge and to what extent do they rely on or seek out formal intellectual property mechanisms such as patents and copyrights and trademarks. And our findings uh, after about a decade of research are that in fact, no, formal modes of intellectual property protection are not the default for uh, African innovators in the kinds of settings that we've been looking at, the collaborative settings. So the, ma the maker movement in fact, we feel cro crosses a number of the, these, these research clusters. Definitely it's where we see examples of informal innovation. Sometimes we find uh, these maker communities are part of technology hubs. Sometimes the uh, entrepreneurship that we see is, is linked to tr traditional or indigenous knowledge. And also open air's desire to 
look at innovation metrics, it also connects to the maker movement because we're interested in, you know, how do you begin to measure the type of innovation that's happening in African settings when, in fact, you know, African countries don't have a large number of patents. And so the question is, we know the innovation's happening. How do you measure it? We think that actually the maker movement and the kinds of innovation happening in what we would call sort of semi-formal institutions, and I'll come to that idea at the end of this presentation, that that can be one of the places to look for sort of alternative measurements of innovation, apart from the sort of traditional ones. And then, of course, laws and policies connect to all of these things. In at both national level and international level. So, what I'm going to be speaking about for the next few minutes is the the research I've been involved in in South Africa with maker communities. Now, I should specify we call we call them maker communities because we we find that to be the most flexible term. To use. So a fab lab for us is a maker community, a maker space is a community, but we also are aware of virtual communities. Or in fact, I've recently heard about a, a community that had a physical meeting space, but actually has now gone virtual. So, um, and also talking about maker communities also connects to kind of an emerging theme in our research, which I'll come to at the end, which is seeing makers as participating in, in communities of practice, which is a particular conceptual construct that we find interesting. But the, the, the data I'm gonna be briefly talking about today was gathered, you'll see there in, this, in the slide, from 2016 to 18, um, we uh, gathered uh, data on maker communities across South Africa. Um, and then we've also done follow-up data collection in 2018 and 19. And you can see the details of that in the presentation slide. We were supposed to be doing more data collection in 2020, but um, for obvious reasons with COVID, um, 2020 has been a, a, bit of a, a bit of a lost year um, for data collection. So just quickly to give you an idea of the scale of the maker, movement or the number of maker communities in South Africa. There you can see them. I won't obviously go through all of them, but you can see that Gauteng province, which is actually the small blue province near the top of the map, but that's the province that has, contains Johannesburg and Pretoria um, and is the sort of economic engine of South Africa. You can see it has a large number of maker communities. Other provinces you can see we, we've just at currently identified just one, except for the Western Cape province, which has Cape Town as its hub. You can see it also has a number of maker communities. But I, I should caution that it's a shifting, I'm sure it's similar in Australia and many parts of the world. It's a, it's a shifting picture where, um, you know, new projects emerge, some they, they fail or they take new shape. So it's really important very difficult to give an accurate representation of the number of maker communities at any given time in South Africa. So just, just to give you an idea of, of when we collected our data with maker communities, we, we were looking at descriptive elements, which you can see in the three circles uh, on the top right there. So we looked at management variables, activity variables, and spatial variables, which I think is pretty self-evident, the kinds of things we would we were asking the communities or we were looking at online for evidence of. Um, but then in terms of the conceptual and analytical elements, you can see those in the, the three circles in the, the bottom left, the green, blue, and orange. In there, you see things like innovation, openness, collaboration, sharing, knowledge appropriation, which includes intellectual property. Then in the blue circle, you can see outreach, networking, partnerships, institutionalization, which is a theme I'm gonna touch on. Uh, in the next slide, scaling, sustainability, um, and then in the orange circle, uh, the sort of links to the informal sector, which, and, and informal innovation, and gender empowerment, those kind of outreach elements. I should say, when I was giving the introduction to Open Air, uh, I forgot to mention that, that Open Air is also very much interested in the matter of scaling. So to what degree do, to what degree and how do the innovations that emerge um, from 
these open innovation settings in Africa, to what degree or how are they able to scale? Um, uh, we find that to be a very interesting thing to look at. So one particular set of findings that we generated, and was that, it's actually the title of this presentation, is looking at um, institution, the sort of interface between institutionalization and informal innovation in South African maker communities. The reason we we took that kind of slice into the data was actually generate was actually uh, inspired by uh, the Journal of Peer Production, which put out a call for papers focusing on institutionalization. So. Uh, you know, at first we we focused on institutionalization, institutionalization because it was the requirements of a journal, but then we actually found it to be a very interesting lens um, to look at. So you can see there on that that slide the three ways that we defined institutionalization: formalization of practices, you know, for for instance through charging membership fees or through linking to sort of formalized market opportunities, or in the case of the South African makers, we saw that they were trying to form a, a national association. A second form of institutionalization we identified were partnerships, all sorts of kinds uh, of partnerships. And you can see them listed there with government entities, with schools, technical colleges, with foreign government entities, with international organizations like the UN, with private sector bodies, with the nonprofit sector, and we also just saw a general um, openness on the part of the South African Maker Collective, which is a, a very loose grouping of South African uh, maker communities that they were generally speaking the language of partnerships. And we also found interestingly that we found a very much an interest in South African maker communities and in the South African Maker Collective to partner with us as the Open Air Network. We as Open Air, you know, we, we're, we're conducting sort of developmental research and the, we even try to use elements of action research. So um, in fact, we, uh, you know, we try to, um, you know, try not to have such a hierarchical relationship with the people or in this case, communities that we're researching. So we, in fact, um, collaborated with the South African Maker Collective um, in in a in hosting a national workshop of of South African makers, and so we as Open Air were presenting and facilitating, but we over, we actually handed over parts of the workshop to the makers themselves. So we saw that as also a sign of uh, a, a desire to to partner with even with us as as researchers, you know, representing researchers from a number of different African countries. And then the final type of institutionalization, which may in a sense seem like the most obvious one is sort of in being embedded or partially embedded in uh, a formal organization. And you see there the list. So we've seen examples of uh, makerspaces being embedded in you know, government entities, government funded entities, in tertiary education entities, in university linked technology hub, an example of that being the TMG makerspace that uh, my, I guess I call her a colleague, Mia Fan Sale of TMG makerspace, who I know is also presenting to your, um, your workshop. Um, so you'll, you'll know more, you already know a bit about the kind of uh, embeddedness they have within not just a university, set, uh, digital innovation hub, but within what they call sort of an ecosystem. But again, there are some formal entities within that ecosystem. Then we also have examples of maker communities in, embedded in nonprofit found, foundation entities and um, even in private sector entities. We also found um, when we were looking at those maker communities, we found examples of what we see as the key elements of informal innovation. Um, now, obviously, you'd have to you'd have to read the paper, which I do give the link to at the end of this presentation to sort of see how we define informal innovation. But essentially, we looked at well, five elements that we think are key to informal innovation in Af particularly in African settings, constraint based innovation, incremental innovation, collaborative innovation, 
informal approaches to knowledge appropriation, which is what I referred to earlier, i.e. we did not find, um, we found very little interest among participants in these maker communities in formalized knowledge appropriation via formalized IP rights. And um, also innovation in informal networks and communities in informal settings. So you can see there in the slide, uh, some quotes, those are from some of the maker participants. And I, can't, I, I don't wanna go through all of this. Um, I'm sure Professor Rimmer will perhaps be able to ask me about a couple of these things that if he finds they're of interest. But I mean, just to give one example of a constraint-based innovation, um, one of the innovators we interviewed uh, at a Johannesburg-based maker community was working on a smart, smart pavement bricks um, to address security needs. So essentially putting uh, sensors in bricks to put in, that people could put in their driveways um, in order to alert them to uh, you know, unusual activity in their driveways, which again is um, you know, essentially in Johannesburg, unfortunately, um, there, there, there are crime problems. And so this we see as an example of a constraint-based innovation or, or a, a innovation very much linked to the environment. And I think the other one that's above that under a constraint-based innovation is the Morgan 3D printer, which was developed by a, an innovator with a maker community uh, next to Pretoria. And he told us he developed it because when he st first started wanting to use 3D printers, they were prohibitively expensive in South Africa. So that's why he wanted to generate a low cost, open source, rep wrap uh, 3D printer, which he did uh, the Morgan 3D printer. And then he started uh, manufacturing them and selling them at, at low cost to local innovators. So what we found in that research, sort of overall, a couple of, a few of the main findings we, we drew from looking at, as I said, institutionalization elements and informal uh, innovation elements, is we actually found that institutionalization seemed to be offering synergies more than tensions um, with informal innovation modalities. So essentially we found that as, maker communities institutionalized more, i.e. maybe by charging fees or uh, charging uh, rent to innovators or by uh, increasing the, the number of partnerships that they were engaged in with say government or private sector entities. We didn't actually find that that was constraining their, the ability of those communities to engage in sort of informal innovation and not, we didn't, find that they were that their innovation priorities or their ability to bring in grassroots people to innovate um, were being uh, undermined as far as we could tell. We also felt that we saw maker communities emerging as intermediaries between actors in the informal and formal parts of the innovation ecosystem. Now that's probably seems obvious to many of you who are in, you know, involved in the maker community or studying the maker community, but we do think that's quite a, a potentially significant thing, a role that maker communities in a country like South Africa, which you know has you know very um, a huge disparities in wealth. So you do have very well uh, resourced members of the population and obviously people living in extreme poverty and. So, and then you, you do have a strong, at least in African or in developing world terms, you do have a strong um, formal sector. You do have strong formal institutions in uh, South Africa, but at the same time, you have a huge number of people who are uh, making a living in the informal sector. Not maybe as great a percentage in the rest of Africa, but again, but again a huge, uh, amount of productive activities in the informal sector. And so maker, maker communities or maker spaces or fab labs, whatever you want to call them, we see that in the South African context, that could be, it, it appears to be an emerging role and it could be a very key role is somehow being that linkage, i.e. the people within a maker community and their management and leadership having their kind of their feet 
both in the informal and formal sectors, and ultimately helping people who innovators, grassroots innovators who are for the most part existing in the informal sector, helping them to where they need to connect to informal institutions or to connect to people who have the skills that, that they've picked up in the informal sector, sorry, in the formal sector. Um, and finally, we uh, link to that, we see, we see maker communities as in a way, you could, we could call them actually semi-formal actors, like bridging actors, like they're neither, we think the ones that are, the ones that have perhaps the most potential and sustainability are those ones that are sort of neither fully, neither fully formal or, or uh, nor uh, fully semi-formal. And then the, the, the next set of findings we're, we're working on based on uh, the, the, the latest set of interviews we did in 2018, 2019, is going to look more at socioeconomic inclusion, which I do believe is one of the things that your conference is trying to look at. I can't report our findings yet because that data analysis is happening um, right now. It's not complete, but we are really wanting to look. Look, some of the themes are similar to what I've just discussed, but um, if you look at the the bullet points there, I think particularly interesting is the final one: um, communities of practice. We think that that construct which has actually been around for a long time if you you know if, if you look if you google it in the literature many of you i'm sure have come across it um but it, it's a it's a it's a conceptual framework community of practice that's you know that's actually evolved and it, we've identified particular pieces of literature that we think give it quite an interesting uh casting and we think for instance one interesting element of, of communities of practice in the recent literature is the idea of a, of, a, of a community of practice playing a brokering role. So that the people who join that community of practice, okay, they join it out of a shared interest, a uh, shared identity, that's, that's standard to the notion of community of practice. But the, the idea that the part of the, the strength of the community of practice is it, it, is it brokers, it, it, it creates relationships with, uh, or or or, or uh, facilitates access to other entities and opportunities. And again, we think that again fits with what we seem to be seeing in 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 South Africa with some of the successful maker communities that they seem to be acting as as brokers as part of that linkage that I mentioned before, that linkage between informal sector or informal innovators and the formal sector and and formal sector innovation. So these are um, some resources. Um, you'll see the link at the top to op the Open African Innovation Research Network that I spoke about at the beginning, the South African Maker Collective, which I mentioned in the presentation. Also the Africa Makerspace Gathering is there. And that is a sort of, that's an, emergence, an emerging African continental grouping um, that we as Open Air are, so collaborating with and the South African makers are increasingly starting to collaborate with as well. And there is uh, so, some of the literature produced by members of the open air network on the maker community. You'll see that um, most of the studies focus on South Africa, but there is one study there focusing on uh, the maker movement in North Africa, Egypt, Tunisia, and Morocco. And there is one uh, study there that looks at uh, Fab Labs and 3D printing in South Africa and Kenya. So uh, open air's research on the maker movement is not um, just focused on South Africa. We have another researcher, um, his literature not, isn't mentioned there, um, who he's a Francophone researcher and he's been doing work on uh, make, the maker movement in Senegal, Burkina Faso and Cameroon. So we will also uh, hopefully soon be publishing some results from, from those countries as well. So I now, um, I'd be grateful for some uh, questions from Professor Rimmer, but just before we do that, I just 
there are my uh, contacts, my two email addresses at uh, Vitz University in Johannesburg and University of Ottawa. So please, any of you who are there at that uh, workshop who have would like to share ideas, find out more about open air research, um, uh, you know, any, anything, please, please reach out. And there at the bottom of the screen, you can see all the participating uh, institutions and funders of open air. Thank you.